Hi guys, Buildzoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at the X570 Creator from ASRock. So this board, as the name implies, is targeted at content creators, the latest marketing buzzword that replaced gaming in the motherboard... Uh, for, for motherboard manufacturers. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what we've been using for years to manage our own Gamers Nexus store, and we've been incredibly happy with the choice. Squarespace makes e-commerce easy for those interested in starting stores, but it also has powerful tools to build all types of websites. Photo galleries for photographers, resume and portfolio sites, and small business sites are all easily done through Squarespace. Having built a lot of client websites the old way before running GN full-time, we can easily recommend Squarespace as a powerful, fast solution. Go to squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. Um, so what that basically means in terms of this motherboard is that you get a couple extra um, sort of like workstation class features. And in this case, it is a 10 gig LAN from Aquantia, which I assume is hiding under this heatsink because that chip does get actually quite hot. Uh, so i just put Aqua under that because I'm not going to spell out the whole thing. We all can see that I write too slow. There's also a one gig Intel that I assume is on that port, but the chip is probably that. Um, so you get one gig Intel, and you also get two uh, Thunderbolt 3 ports on the rear I.O. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. I unfortunately know absolutely nothing about Thunderbolt 3, so, you know, it's just like, basically, if you want Thunderbolt 3, um, or you want 10 gig LAN, and you find the price point of this motherboard acceptable, also the fact that it is ATX, whereas, like, uh, one of the other sort of like the other like the main the board that really directly competes with this at least in terms of like the marketing language would be the x570 creation from MSI and that's EATX and obviously EATX motherboards can run into some case compatibility issues so you know potentially that might might be a concern for you when, when choosing between this and the creation though I can't remember the full feature set for the creation either so <laughs> you know I can't do a direct comparison there. Anyway, so that's kind of the, 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 the creator type features. And next we get a whole bunch of overclocking features. So that's obviously what, what I'll get right into. Right? Oh, I also forget to, forgot to mention the Wi-Fi 6 card that we have up here. Anyway, let's get into the overclocking features. So right here we have a BIOS flashback button. So that means you can update the BIOS of the motherboard without even having a CPU installed. Um, it does allow you to actually recover from corrupted BIOSes. So basically, let's say you're flashing your BIOS and the power goes out. Um, you can actually flash right over a corrupted BIOS in this way um, with the BIOS flashback functionality. So that's uh, really, really cool that the board has that. Um, personally, I would have also welcomed a rear I.O. mounted clear CMOS button because otherwise, you know, at least so far my experience with X570 has been that the platform absolutely bloody sucks at recovering. As in, if you punch in a bunch of memory settings that don't work, your motherboard's going to basically get stuck on not posting forever uh, until you, you clear the BIOS. So I would really welcome a clear CMOS switch on, on the rear I.O. because... Uh, you're going to be, I, I think you're, you'd end up reaching into your case very often if you were doing any serious memory overclocking without, you know, using a test bench to do it. Um, but if you did use a test bench, then yeah, you do have a clear CMOS button right here. Um, there's also a clear CMOS jumper, I think right there. But, you know, the button kind of negates the, like, you know, makes that kind of irrelevant. Anyway, next to that, we also get power and reset. And of course, the postcode, which is super handy for troubleshooting any kind of boot up issues, um, especially if the motherboard vendor actually does a good job of documenting the various post, like the various postcodes that you might get stuck on in their motherboard manual, which not necessarily all of them do. Um, but sometimes they are sort of interchange. like you can check other motherboard vendor manuals for to figure out what the errors mean as well, but um, not necessarily always. Anyway, so that covers the sort of, you know, top level overclocking features. And next we're going to get into the power delivery, starting off with the extra unnecessary four pin. So the thing is, this single eight pin right here can handle at least 384 watts by spec. Now, not necessarily all PSUs will I be... Well, actually, no, all PSUs should be able to do that, but they might not do that with ease. The thing is, though, that 384 watts is literally impossible to hit, even on a 3950X. 
um, at like ridiculous voltages. Like these, the the thing about seven nanometer Ryzen is that it just doesn't pull that much power because it's seven nanometer. Okay, like it just really doesn't get that power hungry. So. Yeah, you don't need more than a single 8-pin. But, of course, all high-end motherboards have more power connectors than a single 8-pin because, I don't know, like, I, I assume the it's basically like, hey, from a marketing perspective, it makes the motherboard look more featured because you have more connectors, right? More connectors is better than less connectors. That's, that's a good enough reason to put a whole extra 4-pin that doesn't do anything except freak people out about their power supply compatibility. Um, that, that's a great reason to put one of those on there, right? So yeah, also basically it means you don't need to plug this in. Seriously, you don't need to plug that in. Um, you can just act like it isn't there. Uh, you can just plug in the single 8 pin and you'll be fine. So then, let's move on to the actual VRM where we get things that are actually, well, arguably more useful than the extra 8 pin because honestly on the high-end motherboards the VRMs get so insanely overkill that the the usefulness kind of falls into the same range as that extra four pin though I'd argue if your VRM is so good that it doesn't need a heatsink it does have aesthetic benefits for the motherboard because it means the heatsink can be designed with looks prioritized instead of actual function um, which is kind of how we ended up in the awkward situation where like a lot of heat sinks these days, you know, aren't very functional. Like, a lot of heat sinks have recently been not very functional because Intel put out a bunch of platforms where the VRM basically didn't have to do anything for a while, and then it's like, oh, and now the VRM has to work, and everybody's like, but we forgot how to make heat sinks. So, anyway, what are we looking at in terms of VRM on this board? Well, um, that right there is your SOC. The rest of this is vCore. It's a uh, 12 plus 2 phase configuration, so, you know, 12 plus 2. Of course, uh, ASRock, like basically everybody else that isn't Gigabyte, has not discovered the magic of the Infineon XDP E132G5C. So this chip right over here is, of course, the IR35201, uh, which for the longest time was the default high-end voltage controller of choice for high-end motherboards, because there's really not anything better you could get than that until the new Infineon chip came out. Anyway, so ASRock's running that configured in a 6 plus 2 phase configuration, and then they do times 2 by the use of a bunch of IR3599s, um, so that's that's where they get their 12 phases. So they, they use a bunch of IR3599s to get the... to double into the 12 phase, but, uh... Uh, where was I going with that? Well, yeah, so they have a bunch of doublers. Those are located on the back of the board, and unfortunately, I don't have a proper back of the board picture, so I can't show them to you, but I know for a fact that they're there. Like, I've seen the back of the board. It's just I don't have a picture to show, show it to you on. So... Yeah, um, this does use a bunch of 3599s. This do, these allow the VRM basically to fully interleave all 12 of the phases. It also allows the VRM to actually, well, it actually allows the IR35201 to current balance the phases, which is something I realized while digging through International Rectifier's document, documentation for the IR35201, because normally a lot of other voltage regular, like a lot of other controller vendors, their doublers do all of the current balancing. It's not the controller doing it, it's the doubler doing it. But IR does it differently, so their controller actually does it, which is why, like, if, if you use a 3599 with some less smart controllers, you don't have any current balancing. But if you use it with like high-end international rectifier parts, then you do have current balancing. So that's kind of like the, like th these are dumb. They don't current balance, but the controller can if it's good enough. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's what's kind of going on with the control scheme. The other thing worth noting about the 3599 being a doubler, it of course adds some delay to your PWM signals, um, which does mean that it is more difficult to get good transient response. The thing is, there is a lot of different ways to improve transient response from your voltage regulator that don't include the actual control loop itself, because there's a lot of, like, you have a lot of transients that are basically faster than the, uh, than the capabilities of the controller itself ever, which is why you, you know, you have, like, bulk capacitors and all of that. On the output of uh, on, on the output of the VRM and so depending on also like depending on what kind of inductors are used and what selection of capacitors is used and then what like basically it's impossible to say that this VRM like inherently the control loop is slower so it sh 
it's harder for ASRock to get good transient performance, transient response out of it. That does not mean it is impossible for them to say match voltage regulators that don't have any doublers in them at all. Right? Like it is possible. It's just more difficult than than otherwise. So, um, yeah, that, that's what's going on with the control scheme. And uh, at this point, let's just look at the actual power stages. So for the power stages, ASRock is using um, IR35. Actually, I could have just put that right there, right? Like, wh why bother with making that line all complicated? Uh, IR3555s. Um, so these are, of course, 60 amp uh, POW IR stages um, from International Rectifier. And uh, that's, that's the actual marketing name for them. Um, and the reason why they get this special marketing name is basically they integrate a whole bunch of extra features like body braking mode, which is for load release transient uh, improvements. Then they have things like um, body braking mode. They have integrated temperature monitoring, integrated current monitoring. The current monitoring is not as accurate as what you get on like newer smart power stages. That's a completely like that. That's a newer, higher spec of like current monitoring functionality from the from the actual power stage but these do integrate some level of current monitoring they also don't integrate all of the safeties that new, uh, modern smart power stages do but uh yeah the, these are like for a very long time if you wanted a top end power stage it was basically 3555 or 3575 which the 3575 is a 3555 with a more expensive packaging method and that's it so basically it, like it, the the actual underlying silicon is is you want a 3555 like that that's what you wanted and then you could opt for like a thermally enhanced package and that was basically your choice um so yeah asrock's kind of going like so it's not you know in, in like for for 2019 this isn't some mind-blowing voltage regulator design that asrock has thrown together but uh that asrock has put together they ha real, this isn't thrown together um though i arguably well no nah, this this isn't thrown together it's like it'd be thrown together if they recycled it off of some other motherboard but i'm actually not aware of asrock using a vrm like this anywhere in the recent past so th this is a pretty new design for them actually um but uh yeah so you know th this is like this is a very nice vrm that asrock has put together but by tw 2019 standards it's not some you know great new vrm like we're seeing a lot of like there's the 70 amp smart power stages there's of course the infineon controllers going around um yeah so there's there's better things you can build these days but this is definitely not bad um and you know the efficiency of this reflects that so for the following output of uh, following operating parameters of 1.2 volts output voltage 400 kilohertz switching frequency and uh, 5 volts drive um, you're going to be looking at the following efficiency figures for this VRM. So 100 amps output, it's going to be producing about 11 watts of heat, which is actually like, th this is not the most efficient for 100 amps, mostly because this has a little too many phases for 100 amps output. But if the controller is set up correctly, then it could just turn the VRM down to 8 or 10 phases to get higher efficiency in the low loading range, like 100 amps output. Now, going up to higher current outputs, like, say, 150 amps, uh, this VRM would produce about 15 watts of heat. And also, the 100 amps output, that's like a, that's like a first gen 8 core or a third gen 8 core. Um, second gen CPUs are actually, funnily enough, per core, the most power hungry because the 12 nanometer process is like the 14 nanometer process, just like way higher leakage. So, yeah, um, that, that's kind of how that works out. But anyway, 150 amps is basically where you'd be seeing like a third gen 12 core, but like completely maxed out running Prime 95 with like AVX. So that would pull about 150 amps and the VRM would produce about 15 watts of heat. Um, at this point, the VRM should still not require, like it shouldn't necessarily require a heat sink yet. Um, so that, that's pretty great right there. Going up to 200 amps output, um, you're going to be seeing about uh, 19 watts of heat. And I think this is where the VRM actually hits peak efficiency. We're pretty close to 200 amps output is where it hits peak, uh, peak efficiency because relative to how much current it's pushing, this is the lowest uh, heat output um, that we've seen so far. But uh, yeah, so this is like if you had a 3950X just completely maxed out, so the 16 core, 
And by completely maxed out, you'd be looking at like say 1.3 volts uh, V core and 200 amps under like AVX um, Prime 95. And actually 1.3 volts shouldn't get, well, no, you'd be actually looking slightly above 1.3 volts for, for that kind of current draw. So yeah, um, in, you know, AVX Prime 95. So yeah, th this VRM is more like, it's, it's plenty for, for powering any CPU you can put into an AM4 socket. Um, at the at the 200 amp output figure, it would actually probably start needing a heatsink as 19 watts of heat. Like, it's not that much heat per phase, but the thing is, is like, well, there's seven of them right next to each other right here. Um, and there's like, it depends on how good the PCB itself of the motherboard is at shedding heat. But, uh, you know, generally, like, it, it's like the board comes with a heat sink. So, you know, it's not like the consideration of it could run without a, if this can be run with or without a heat sink, not really that important because the board does come with a heat sink. And that should be more than able to deal with a, just 19 watts of heat. Um, at least adequately enough for this 12 phase to not like run stupid hot. So, yeah, like the, the VRM right here is plenty capable of powering any CPU you can fit in the AM4 socket right now. And for sort of just academic purposes, what if you push 300 amps and higher for current draws? Well, 300 amps output, you'd be looking at about 30 watts of heat. So you can kind of see how like 150, 15 watts, 300 amps, 30 watts, but 200 amps, 19 watts, because that's hitting the efficiency peak. And here we're starting to sort of, because the efficiency curve for power stages looks very much like this and then it sort of let well and then it levels off um so yeah and basically so that 200 amp figure would be somewhere in this range and then like the the 300 amps would be somewhere like down here and then 150 would be like here and then of course 100 amps would be right like in in the really low end of the curve so yeah anyway so 300 amps, 30 watts. Um, at this point, you definitely need a heatsink. 400 amps, you'd be looking at about uh, 48 watts. Uh, heatsink with significant airflow. And 500 amps, you'd be looking at like, well, a ton of airflow or potentially like at this point, a water block might actually make a lot of sense. Um, so yeah though you know it's not really like the cpu is never actually going to pull that so that's not really and, and this is like a you know this board's targeted at content creators not really like extreme overclockers not that it n isn't necessarily capable of doing extreme overclocking it's just that i think um extreme overclocker like the extreme overclockers have other options that are better suited towards that than you know this right here because this has things like 10 gig lan which you don't care about if you're pushing CPUs on liquid nitrogen Thunderbolt, which you also don't care about. You know, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that like, yeah, not necessary for extreme overclocking. And this VRM really isn't like the, isn't the height of VRM design on X570 either. So there's other better options uh, if you're going for, for extreme overclocks. But uh, yeah, like this board, at least, you know, like the main point of these really high current output figures is to show like where the really ridiculous power stages have advantages, like say the 14 phase 70 amp smart power stage voltage regulators, like those start having advan major advantages once you get into these current draw figures, not really in this range. In this range, they're not really that impressive. So yeah, um, but ultimately this is a really, really solid VRM, right? Power delivery wise, this should have no problem powering anything you can fit in the socket. Um, and then in terms of the control scheme, I mean, it's basically the, the best we've had for the last several years. It's just that now we're finally starting to see some better options from, you know, Infineon. Um, so yeah, great VRM on this board. And actually this is the most powerful VRM that ASRock, like this is the most powerful VRM I've seen on an X570 ASRock board so far, because all of their other boards use an Intersil VRM with 50 amp Vichy, um, Vichy power stages. So yeah, um, you know, those are slightly worse voltage regulators from, from ASRock on their other boards for the lower end. Anyway, the SOC VRM just uses more of the same. So the SOC VRM is absolutely insane overkill because like the, this board, like you could run an APU in this. It just doesn't really make any sense to do that. And if you're not running an APU, you really don't need a lot of SOC power whatsoever. Um, so 
yeah, the 60 amp power stages, two 60 amp power stages are more than enough for any kind of like for SOC power. It's actually really, really overkill. So yeah, nothing to complain about there either. And with that out of the way, let's move on to the memory VRM. And for the memory VRM, ASRock is, uh, I guess, together with Asus on this, where it's like they insist on two-phase memory power. Um, so, yeah, we've got two phases. I'm not sure about the controller. It seems to be some kind of UPI semiconductor thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's a two-phase controller. Like, that is way too big a chip to not be a two-phase if you wanted a single phase, you can get it like this big. <laughs> so, like, there's no reason for a single phase controller to be that large. Um, so, that is a UPI two phase controller. And then for the MOSFETs here, they're actually using dual NFETs from Sinopower, and those are SM7341 uh, dual NFETs. Um, so, UPI 7341 both the high side and the low side MOSFET, you know, integrated into one chip. Um, and that basically just sim simplifies the, the voltage regulator design. And it also makes it possible for, like, you can get certain, like, dual, you can sometimes get, like, dual NFETs really specifically tuned for uh, buck converter use. And they'll basically have, like, better parameters than if you're just buying separate discrete MOSFETs. So, yeah, anyway, it doesn't really matter that much for DDR4 because DDR4 doesn't really pull enough power to worry about how you power it. Um, really what it comes down to when it comes to memory overclocking is not like how many phases you have, but what do you do in this area between the CPU socket and the dim slots in terms of your memory layout, and then potentially also your filtering, con like your filtering capacitors for the memory power delivery, um, which is kind of related to the fa number of phases you have, because you need potentially less like bulk capacitors if you have more phases, but, um, yeah, for the most part, like, you can get away with single-phase designs. There are some very, very good, like, there are motherboards with very good memory overclocking capabilities and single-phase memory VRMs. Um, so, you know, how many phases you throw at it is not really, like, it affects how you design the rest of the memory system, but it doesn't say, like, it doesn't immediately tell you if, if the board's better or worse at memory overclocking. Anyway, so, yeah, that pretty much wraps it up for this board. There's not really, like, I think it's one of the, like, better featured boards out there, but I find that there's not that much to talk about with this board, mostly because at this point I've covered so many X570 boards. So, yeah, you know, we, we've got a uh, very solid voltage regulator design from, from ASRock, um, then a memory layout that who knows how well it works out. Like, I'm not sure. Um... You know, we, we've got a more powerful memory VRM than what you see normal on a lot of other X570 boards. Um, but again, like, it's really about the BIOS and the memory layout. And uh, you have a really overkill SoC, which is actually pretty standard for high-end X570 boards. Um, I really think the highlight with this board is just, like, the, the Thunder... Like, you know, if you want to buy this board, it's going to be for, like, the Thunderbolt 3 or the 10 gig uh, LAN. One of the two, because... There's not really, in any other department, you can find other boards that do the same for, I assume, lower prices or do better for the same, uh, you know, for potentially the same price. Um, so, yeah, that's it for the ASRock uh, X570 creator. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support Gamers Nexus, uh, we do have a Patreon. There's also store.gamersnexus. Well, we have a Patreon if you want to support us dis directly. Uh, and then there's also store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to buy any Gamers Nexus themed merch like shirts, mugs, toolkits, posters that kind of thing. There's links to both down in the description below. And uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, and I have a channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking where I do more PCB breakdowns and other overclocking related content. So if you'd like to check that out, that would be awesome. I assume there's going to be a link somewhere below the video, either in the comment section or the de description. And uh, yeah, that, that that's it for this video. So thanks for watching and goodbye.